Fala galera, Christian aqui comandando o Heavy Culture Talk hoje com Kyle Thomas Trouble Exorder. Um, hoje a gente vai estar conversando sobre um pouco do Trouble, um pouco do Exorder também, algumas curiosidades, né? Então não esqueçam né, de se inscrever no canal, quem não é inscrito, né? Uh, também deem o seu like ali, né? E vamos começar falando a respeito do Exorder com o Kyle. Well, Kyle, it was such a great pleasure to have you here, okay? And uh, the first question is like about Exorder, okay? How do you see Slaughter in the Vatican? Because this album is still very important in the trash metal scene, and I could say it's very current too. Uh, how do you see it after this long years, you know? Uh, well, first of all, good morning. Of all, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, regarding Slaughter in the Vatican, uh, it's, it's, it's really, in hindsight, after so many years, we started that back in 1986. Some of the songs were written in 1985. And, uh, you know, we were kids at the time, uh, really just kind of playing music that we wanted to hear, not really thinking about the impact it would have over a long period of time. And to this day, it's still extremely popular. Um, the, the record has been called a classic by, you know, the, the average listener, the, the, some of the publications out there that, that, you know, cover heavy metal uh, in a media form. So it's flattering, yeah, uh, that after all these years, these songs still, as you said, kind of feel current. So uh, I, I'm just kind of feeling lucky that people still care. <laughs> yeah, one one thing that is interesting uh, about Flooded in the Vatican is, is the fact that the new generation is starting to discover the album because of this uh, revival of old bands and bands trying to sound like old bands and then it started to appear again, you know, like it never died for the old guys, but it started to go back to the spotlight again for the new generation. And how do you see this? Thanks to technology. Ah, deu problema na internet. Are you there? Are you there? Yeah, Hello. just fine. <laughs> Uh, did you hear the question or am I, am I supposed to? Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to ask I'm again. Okay. No, there was, a call, there was a call coming through and it, ru it, it ruined everything. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It happens sometimes to me. <laughs> it's, it's the worst part of using the cell phone. Okay. Uh, can I ask the question again? Yes. Okay, so uh, the interesting fact about Slaughter in the Vatican is that it's uh, coming uh, back again for the new generation. It's like the old generation still keeps the album as like one of the most important in the scene, but with this revival of old bands and bands uh, trying to not copy, but sound like the old bands, the new generation is becoming aware of Exorder, Slaughter in the Vatican, the law and things like that. So, like, how do you see this? Um, uh, it's a blessing for us to have this uh, second chance. You know, we, we went a very long time without doing anything, long periods of time in between. And uh, and we try to put it back together and then it wouldn't seem to work. So uh, this time, thankfully, it's it's sticking. Uh, you know, we've had to make some adjustments here and there, but but here we are still going and uh we're, we've actually been doing the album the slaughter in the vatican album in its entirety and people really seem to like the show so all we're trying to really do here is um uh, is, is just keep representing the music the way it was always intended so um uh, the, the 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 kids the kids today being interested in this music again is is a great thing because we all know uh, old people don't keep music alive young people do so yeah. you know, we're grateful that's 
I mean, it's true. You know, we, we're grateful for all the people that are our age or, you know, not far behind us or even older than us that come out and support it and still enjoy it. But when you look out there and there's 12 year olds and 15 year olds uh, that, you know, even eight and nine year olds in the audience that that just gives you hope that this music isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, this is the best thing ever. Well, I would like to ask you a question uh, for you, link it to, it's not a myth, but here in Brazil, you know, we had like, uh, we didn't have much information in the 80s and the 90s because there was a delay in technology, things like that. Not so good English that time too. So it's like lots of fake information too, because you know, magazines are supposed to sell information, not to give the real yes. information. <laughs> Correct. So it's like one thing that I would like to ask you, and there is a fun fact about it, is like uh, X Order and Pantera, because like we in Brazil were taught. It's like I remember when I discovered uh, X Order, a friend of mine showed a cassette and gave it to me. Like, oh, listen to that, and I was like, fuck. And uh, I I'm not a really fan of Pantera, the, the Thrash Metal era. And I said, like, well, it seems like they are doing what Pantera tries to do, but much more like linked to the roots of Thrash Metal. And then it's like, the question is like, who influenced who in this? Because I know Pantera and uh, X Order, they have about the same age, but Pantera was a glam metal and you were already a Thrash Metal band. Uh, well, you know, Pantera had an evolution. Um, like you said early, they were kind of glam-ish. And I don't know if necessarily the music was as glam as maybe the appearance, but a lot of heavy metal bands. I mean, I played in heavy metal bands before I was in Exhorter where I wear the spandex pants and, you know, black yeah. eyeliner. And, you know, we all kind of did at some point, <laughs> yeah. you know, not everybody, but some people did. A lot of the thrash bands we love today, Slayer, Destruction, they wore makeup and leather and, you know, spiked wristbands yeah. and stuff. Uh, but um, <laughs> Pan 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 Pantera, Pantera were very good before even uh, before Phil and Selmo joined them. They were very good and, and well established at what they did. A very hardworking band. Um, now Phil is from New Orleans, like we are. We've known each other since we were teenagers. Been friends for a very long time. In fact, that uh, that platinum album on the wall back there was a gift from Phil. That's for Far Beyond Driven. Uh, wow. So you know we, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, I, I think a lot of the controversy was media uh, and, and fan driven more more than anything. Uh, you know, for me, I, I, I did, you know, I was friends with Daryl as well. I'm, I'm I've been friendly with uh, Rex a long, long time. You know, I, I I've known these guys for years. Uh, so, we, were we doing what they ended up doing? Uh, before they were, you know, in a way, there was things that we were doing that they eventually did, and we were doing them first. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean I think that that there was anything, you know, any kind of blatant ripoff or anything. I, I know that yeah. Phil was very Phil. Phil almost joined Exhorter for a minute uh, because I they were they were forming the, the band was reforming, and I wasn't interested. So Phil was asked. Yeah by the band if he wanted to sing and he said yes and uh when i found out phil wanted my job i took my job back <laughs> no. so uh you know that's just that's that, that's kind of how that went and i think phil maybe you know there was a lot of bands there were a lot of bands interested in phil at the time i know metal church was interested in phil so i, I think he went to the guys in pantera it was like you know i'm really i'm really interested in doing something a little bit more than what we're doing right now so y'all hear me out and i think they just kind of hashed it out and uh, you know, i know we were one of you know we're still one of phil's favorite bands he's told me this before and and people i know tell me the same thing i, I know he's a huge fan and he he helped us tremendously build the underground uh in the dallas fort worth area when he was you know living out there with the pantera guys just building all that stuff so um 
it, it's a frustrating thing to me because uh, I, I guess it's kind of like the the poor man's version of Metallica versus Megadeth, I guess, you know? But Yeah. Um, yeah, but a little bit different. Like a well, verse, you know, it's, like, it's a comparison, I think, more like that. I, I, I just I don't think it I don't think it needs to be that big of a of a of a conversation anymore. You know, the, basically we've we, we've reformed back in and twenty seventeen, and we're you know still going strong. About to do our second yeah. album in that time frame, and they're putting uh, some shows together uh, with some friends to to bring the band and songs back to life, which I think is a great thing. So there's room for there's room for both. <laughs> yeah, and, and how is it to bring back uh, Exorder to the stage again? How do you feel about it? Um, I love it. You know, I'm 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 especially enjoying playing the guitar now. Uh, it's it's given me a brand new appreciation for the music, um, for the performance. Uh, it's just kind of given me a spark of enjoyment that I hadn't really had with it in a long time. Um, I, I, I really don't listen to a lot of thrash at home in my free time. Yeah. But now that I'm playing guitar, I, I, I tend to enjoy it a little bit more. I, I really enjoy going out and watching new young bands play. That's, that's something I have been doing quite a bit of. So, um, yeah, this the, the just the fact that people even care at all, and we have an opportunity to come back doing this at a high level. So uh, we're just going to kind of keep trying and pick up where we left off and try to finish this job. Yeah. Well, talking about the album, The Law, it had very good reviews from the media and things like that. And also they called kind of groove music. How do you see that album and the importance of that album? What a strange <laughs> album. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the album because it was – a lot of hard work went into that album, um, but we weren't well prepared when we started it. So yeah. um, a lot of it was hurried. We we had to borrow songs from our first demo. We 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 ended up putting the Black Sabbath song on there. Uh, I mean, we love playing the Black Sabbath song live, obviously. And Black Sabbath's my yeah. favorite band. But uh, to be honest and fair, we put that album on that album because we just didn't have enough new songs. And going back and listening to those songs now, there's so many parts in those songs. I, I feel like there's enough material on there that we didn't even have to rob our demo or the Black Sabbath song and put it on there. We had enough material in the other songs. There was just so many parts. Um, we By the time we recorded Slaughter in the Vatican, the songs had been recorded two or three times, some of them, and we were you know, well prepared to go in and put this album down. And it, yeah. you know, it, we just, we just weren't that prepared for the law. So uh, it, it had, there were some uh, recording mistakes that we made uh, just being young and inexperienced that, that, that caused, I think sonically the sound of that album uh, isn't quite where I'd like it to be. Um, you know, I, I've, I, I've probably, I've probably been harder on that album than I should be, but of the three albums that we put out so far, I think it's, I think it's the one that probably has the most things. If I could go back and change, I would. Yeah, it's like uh, the fun fact is like when you we like the musicians don't like very much an album, the media says it's amazing. I guess you're not wrong because I've had people tell me they're like. You know, we we formed our, our our band formed our whole sound around the sound of that album, and I'm sitting there thinking, you formed your band around a mistake. <laughs> that album was a mistake. Uh, but I mean, the album sounds good. It's got its strong points. There, you know, I know things that I would do to it now that would make it sound a lot better. I think, but uh, yeah, you know, I, it, ra rather than sit there and try to fix things that we've already done. I'd rather just start making newer albums that that don't have those mistakes uh, and hopefully have the same spirit and charisma that the first ones had. That's that's the most important thing. Does new material yeah. deserve, deserve the name Exhort? 
deeper. And that's the most important thing. Yeah. So uh, it's like more the southern skies, you know, it's like it's the return of uh, Exhorter as Exhorter. And this album is really important because, as I said, it's the return to the sound of the Exhorter created and all the things like that thrashing. Uh, the, the trashing and rage that you have when you were younger and things like that. And how do you see the importance of this album too? Because this one is like kind of a new beginning, you know? Yeah, 27 years between albums is a long time. So we had a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm extremely proud of that album. I think we finally... With that one, that's the first one that we all sat down and went like, "This is what this out. This is what an Exhorter album is supposed to sound like." So, yeah. um, you know that the songwriting is strong. I, I think we, you know, we had a good representation of our early sound on the album, and also uh, a, a new future with things that we're going to evolve into. Um, as well so you know with I, with this with this with that album we I, we kind of picked up where we left off on the law but we also uh didn't forget about the the past beyond that we we still kept it thrashy uh and you know i i i remember when it first came out some people were like this doesn't sound anything like exhorter i'm like actually this is what Exhort is supposed to sound like. Y'all just didn't yeah. hear it on the first two albums because the first two albums, we didn't truly capture the sound that we really wanted. So uh, mo moving forward, that bigger sound, uh, more wide, not so tightly compressed. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we always were live. And it was just, it was tough to, to capture it in the late 80s, early 90s with the, The, the technological advances that we didn't yet have that we have yeah. now for starters. And, you know, we just didn't have a lot of money to be honest with you to stay in the studio and make it sound the way we wanted to. We, 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 we were not a big money band. <laughs> yeah. But there's like uh, talking about technology. There is an interesting fact that I would like to talk to is the fact that nowadays we have much better technology to record We can record albums faster. We can record albums at home and things like that. And at the same time, it is easy to record an album. It's very difficult to create thrash metal as it was because the new bands or they're a copy of an old one or they don't know what they're doing. And how do you see this? You know, because like I, I think the easier it gets sometimes it's not like the same way that because we had rage we had no money we had no technology to help and then it's like what's most of the compositions were like pure hate because of that condition <laughs> yes yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i i think you know especially like especially for a band like us an older band to 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 try and recreate that anger and rage that you have when you're young uh i i found that the anger and rage is still there i'm just angry about different things than i was when i was young yeah. uh so so yeah but i th i know what you're saying you know you, you you back in the late 80s early 90s that pure <laughs> anger and 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 fire that young people have take it into uh a studio that isn't fancy and equipment that isn't fancy and just plug in and go. It, it, it may not sound like a giant uh, super producer production, but the nastiness and attitude that you capture sometimes on those old demos, that's what you can't, you can't fake that, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's the feeling, you know, the natural feeling of the band. It's like, uh, I, I think when we compose, uh, like when we are composing the feelings and all that we are passing through are linked to the songs. And that's like where the, the rage comes. For instance, it's impossible to have Metallica playing Metallica as the old days because they had lots of, lots of money. So what kind of rage would you focus what kind of thing would you like boredom 
this right. the other things. I, I think it's impossible for Metallica to recreate the old Metallica, you know? It's not the same as Exorder recreating Exorder again because they have loads of money, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's going to change people for sure. Uh, the, the men that they were, uh, come, they were pretty much just coming out of boyhood and they had a lot to be angry about. Uh, their living conditions were definitely not the living conditions that they have now. So, uh, you know, Metallica probably does get a lot of uh, unnecessary criticism for for having evolved so much. But you know, you got to hand it to them. They they're still they're still on top and. Uh, you know, I've seen video footage of them in the last few years, and they're still doing great. I, you know, I don't understand necessarily. It's to me, it's really simple. If you don't enjoy it, turn it off and go put something else on. There's, there's yeah, no I mean, obligation. There's no obligation to listen to new Metallica if you're only a fan of the old Metallica, and they'll probably be the first ones to tell you that. So, uh, same here. You know, uh, I, I probably have a better chance of 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 making you know pure angry music because <laughs> I, I you know my 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 life is nice but i you know i don't have that kind of money and uh, not that that not that i think that that's the only me measure of success is money but no. uh, yeah the art art is born of um, what's the old saying art imitates life so yeah. whatever your life is your art is going to reflect whatever your life is yeah, I, I, I think nowadays uh, thrash metal is, is struggling to return because I, I think after the 90s, because of the grunge too, lots of things were affected, you know, like mainly in the United States where the companies wanted most of the bands to become grungy bands and things like that. I, I think it really affected. It didn't happen in Europe or in Canada, for instance, but there in the United States, the, the thing was kind of ugly for the fashion metal bands, you know. How do you see that they are era? Sorry. Uh, what is the what is the final question? Like, how do you see that grungy era? It's like because I think in the United States it was the most responsible oh, thing for damaging fashion metal, you know. I I know I know what you're saying. Uh, the the success. <laughs> and and fast growth of grunge definitely changed the landscape of music for people that were young people that were listening to thrash for sure um and and i i think i think there was room for both but you know i know i, I don't know how it is where you live but here the 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 people in charge of the music industry have always hated heavy metal and you know hardcore you know extreme music and i think it's because they can't control it because most of the pop world is controlled by people in offices not the artists the you know they the artist yeah. typically doesn't doesn't write the music so the publishing publishing doesn't belong to them they just they they're just basically recording songs written by you know old guys sitting in an office and they they put the music out and you know you don't they don't ha they can't do that for thrash music or or punk music because they don't think like that so i guess when you can't control it and can't control who gets paid what uh, it's something that they kind of wish would just go away even though it makes a lot of money yeah and i think it's just a i really think it's a control thing so uh you know the uh, the grunge movement. Uh, I, I think that was you know they, that was still controlled by the artists, but whatever they were saying at the time, I think just happened to speak to people more than uh, you know aggressive metal and extreme uh, music did. But you know, it, thrash really kind of took an evolution there. I, I think. You know, there there was less of a market for bands like, uh, you know, Creator and Destruction, bands that pioneered and thrashed, but they probably had a tougher time during the late '90s, early 2000s, with with the the uh, 
the growth of, of the grunge era of music. But but at the same time, a lot of that stuff is still very punk rooted. So there was still like, for instance, I saw Soundgarden and Voivod tour together. And, you know, you would think that's kind of a weird pairing, but it wasn't. It was fantastic. They The bands really yeah. went very well together. I think now things are a lot more uh, open. Uh, I think people now are willing to go to more crossover type shows where you might have uh, you might have Alice in Chains, you might have Exodus, you might have Melvins, all on the same bill. And and I I don't think there's any kind of friction there where people are unhappy about this I, to me that's the kind of show i want to see i want to see something that's got a lot of variety if i go to a show i don't want to see five bands that play the same style i just yeah, I lose interest sure. quickly yeah I, I think this kind of festivals they are the most important thing to keep music alive because you have a variety of bands you have bands that wouldn't be able to play in a country because they wouldn't have like such a big audience and then you can get new fans you can attract new bands too it's like it's like too narrow head to to think about like no i don't want to ever accept with like to play with a glam rock band for instance no way it's like it's the mix it's everything is metal after all so it's like uh, this integration between the audiences is, is something that keeps it alive. It's a turning wheel and you need to know how to keep it spinning, you know. And uh, one thing that changed the lot is like radicalism because in the 80s and the 90s, the fans were too radical. That's the problem, I think. And nowadays, the fans are like, uh, like us, we are old. We're not like in, able to do that shit we did when we were kids, you know, like more mature <laughs> think about consequences yeah. and like that you know yeah I, I i think you know maybe back then because most of the people who who were the early bands that played you know the the early thrash bands the early punk bands uh early you know early rap all that stuff too that was all angry music born of people feeling like they had no place and weren't loved and and yeah. you know society didn't appreciate them and that sort of thing it, it's all the same thing it's just it's just different language i think and uh and and now it's definitely a, a lot less shocking i think for people to see somebody walking down the street with a battle vest uh yeah. and a you know goatee or or a mohawk i, I think it's just it's not as shocking as it used to be, um, which is a good thing. Um, I, I mean, the, the shock value part is fun, no doubt about that. But yeah, um, society. society. Uh, you, you, I, I know here in the states, um, if you had tattoos on your arms, you had a hard time getting a job twenty, thirty years ago, and now, it, like, you go to the doctor's office, and the doctor's got tattoos. You know, it's like. It's just different yes. now. People are a lot more accepting of, of change, I think, now, which is good. Yeah, this is a fun fact, because, like, here in Brazil, it's kind of the same. And uh, the one thing that is, I, I still a little bit like, uh, I think it's, it's a little bit weird, but okay, is the fact that when we go to a music store, we see kids with their parents. And uh, when we went to music stores, <laughs> we wouldn't take our parents because we wouldn't get anything from that <laughs> Right. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the, the the parental advisory sticker, explicit lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. You know that here in Brazil, we only listen to bands that that things stick on the album. <laughs> they put parental advisory. We look at that. Must be good. That must be good. The sticker sells records. It does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, talking about now about Trouble, you are now like singing for Trouble. How is it to be playing in this band, which is like a, a very important band in the Doom scenery, you know? I say one of the most important yeah. in the United States. Um, for me, I, I grew up as a fan. Um, so 
I didn't start working with them until mid nineties, maybe late mid nineties. Uh, and for me, it was like, Oh wow. Like to me, that was just like having been asked to like jam in Metallica or Slayer or Black yeah. Sabbath or something, you know, like I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm up here with my heroes. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, so like in the nineties, early two thousands, we played a handful of shows. Then they did another album with Eric Wagner. Um, and then they had a period in between Eric and me. Um, but when they asked me to come back and do that album in 2012, uh, it, it was an easy decision. I was, I was not going to pass on that. Uh, and I'm grateful that they have retained me for this long. Even, you know, we, we haven't done a lot in between. We've, especially lately, we, we've done some tours and, and stuff here and there and the one record. And we're, we're working on a new one. Um, just everything happens very slowly in the world of trouble. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah that, I mean, the great stuff that we're working on for this next one. So um, as long as they want me there, I'm, I'm happy to be there. Yeah, I, I think it must be like one of the coolest thing ever, you know, like when we grew up listening to a band and then we are into a band and you got like a, gosh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, like after this many years, you know, Rick and Bruce are just my friends. They're kind of like big brothers, you know, but like sometimes I'm up on the stage and I look at and they're, they're at the front of the stage doing the twin guitar things. And I'm like, am I really standing up here with these guys? You know, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. And uh, talking as a singer, uh, which one do you think is more difficult to sing? Fresh metal or doom or stone metal, you know? Because, well, in my point of view, like, doom is a little bit difficult to sing because, you know, you have to keep that slow pace singing and, you know, you need to be very good doing that. It's very different. the 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 actual The actual act of singing is easier for me in thrash than it is when I'm singing cleaner stuff, uh, you know, like you know the 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 trouble stuff or you know other things that I've sang throughout the years. I, I mean, I have I have bands that I work with locally here where we play, you know, like uh, Journey and Led Zeppelin and. Uh, Michael Jackson, even, you know, we jam on all kinds of stuff, uh, yeah. just like, you know, party bands, uh, yeah. just to make extra cash. So that's, that's a lot harder than singing thrash to me. Uh, so yeah, doom, I would say the doom stuff is more difficult. I think when things are moving very fast and there's mistakes, uh, there's a, a less chance of someone noticing the mistake because you move on quickly from the mistake. But yeah. when things are very slow, if the things are very slow, if it's bow, 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 and something's not right, you're going to yeah. notice it because it's it it doesn't change quickly. So I, yeah. I think that's where it's precision. Maybe when you forget the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's like. Uh, like uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely been a problem for me in my old age. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, talking about your influences, like, what are the singers that lead you into this world of singing, you know? And also the guitar, uh, because you you also play the guitar. Correct. Yeah, so, so I started as a musician when I was in third grade. I was eight, nine years old when I started playing trumpet. And... um I, I I started playing bass after that. I I never wanted to be a singer. That was never anything I wanted to be. Uh, I, it just found me by accident. So uh, so you know I I I got I worked really hard to become a good bass player when I was fourteen, fifteen years old, and then singing found me. And you know I, I learned guitar along the way, but really I think more than anything, playing playing for, uh, the trumpet for five years gave me. Uh, an ability to be able to pick up just about any instrument I want and figure out how to make it work. If, if I'm not taking lessons from somebody, I'll, I'll figure it out myself. Uh, so yeah. I've been lucky in that regard. It's, it's been, it's been very helpful in songwriting for sure that I can just pick this up, pick that up and make it work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's different for sure. I, I, I you know, as far as, uh, 
the string instruments go, my earliest influences were probably, you know, Black Sabbath, Kiss, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, as far as singers go, I, early on, I, I, I grew up loving Queen, uh, Kiss, Led Zeppelin, uh, Bad Company. There's a lot of really good singers and all of that. Um, so... I guess by the time I started singing, I was listening to Wasp, Twisted Sister, Queens Reich, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of '80s metal, Rat, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, and Metallica. I think, you know, the the vocal, the vocal tone that James Hetfield had early on was a huge influence for me especially when I started singing with the disorder, you know, the, uh, the rapid fire attack of bands like Slayer, Agnostic Front, Corrosion of Conformity, back when they were the three piece, you know, the animosity record. That's, that's the, that's the first punk band that I really like said, Oh, wow. I, you know, I didn't know punk had this much to offer to me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So, um, DRI, uh, a lot of that stuff was very influential on my 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 thrash singing and uh, Exhorter was, uh, but before Exhorter really was welcomed in the heavy metal community, we were welcomed in the punk rock community. So we really started as a punk rock band that just played heavy metal style music. So uh, our our development was in the punk community, not the metal community. Yeah. And one thing that is interesting to talk about singers, you know, it's like most of the heavy metal singers, classical heavy metal singers, they had problems with thrash metal singers, death metal singers, and uh, black metal singers because they said that there was no technique. It was like just dogs barking and things like that. And nowadays they have to admit that people had technique. It's yes. the same as when you say that Yoko Ono doesn't have any technique. She has, but it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is this is the th this is the thing, and and people tend to forget this. Art, music, all of these things are the, are subjective. So, what you love, it may not be what I love, but it doesn't mean it's any less good. Uh, yeah. You know, like uh, someone that loves Queensrÿche probably isn't going to love Gigi Allen. But someone who loves Gigi Allen is probably not going to love Queens, right? You know, uh, so you can sit there and say, oh, it sucks. It sucks. Well, not to this guy or not to this girl. You know, it's, it's just what do you like? And there's so much different. There's so much variation and so many different options. If you don't like it, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, but nowadays I think it's like uh, a little bit more okay. Even the older bands are like kind of admitting that they were like listening to hard rock in the eighties. He did, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and I was like, oh, we we listen to the albums, but we, you know, like we would it be nice to say to the audience, the thrash metal audience or a death metal audience, that we like land, we like uh, hard rock or rap, you know. It's like uh, in that time, people were too narrow-minded. They think that, that the style should be only one style. Yeah, there are a lot of people who are kind of purists that uh, that feel like metal should be the only. Th they love metal. I I never understood people who only love one thing like that. Like now, yeah. when I was young, I used to. I remember telling my mother when I was fifteen years old I, the only thing i'm ever gonna love ever again is heavy metal and and she laughed at me she's like just wait you, you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> you feel a lot what? differently and, and it's true like like at home i i don't listen to a lot of heavy metal at home i i listen to like when i'm hanging around the house i listen to a lot of 70s 60s and 70s funk i listen to a yeah. lot of 80s post-punk new wave uh it's not to say that i don't ever listen to metal but uh, it, one of the funniest things I remember was uh, being on tour with Alabama Thunder Pussy back in 2007, and we were touring with Obituary. And after the show, I'm hanging out with the guys in Obituary, and we're all sitting in the dressing room having beers, listening to the the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. You know, yeah. it's like I mean, we're all we're, we all grew up on that stuff, so it's fun to listen to. It's great music. Uh, you know, it's just. 
to me, the last thing I want to listen to when I'm playing, if I'm playing heavy metal every night, I don't want to listen to it when I'm when I'm finished. I want to listen to something else. Yeah. It's like there, there is an interesting thing, you know, like in my opinion, I don't know if you agree with my opinion, but most of the Ables that trying to sound like uh, Exhorter, Slayer and things like that, they sound like a copy because they are not able to understand the roots of the bands. They're not able to go to the 60s, 70s and listen to that kind of music and say like, hmm, this is how they created the sound. This is how they put a fast pace on it and become what we know as fresh metal, death metal, because... We grow up, like, I was born in 76. Obviously, I have lots of influence of the 70s in my life when I was growing up, you know. So it's like, even for music. And then it's like, people nowadays, they think that they only have to listen to one kind of metal to, like, mime this kind of matter, which is, like, a huge mistake, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think people are... Are cheating themselves out of great things by being stubborn sometimes. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, 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 it's there, there's there's so much out there. Uh, I remember when 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 my brother first started listening to punk rock music, and I I didn't want anything to do with it because I loved heavy metal. I don't want to listen to punk. And then eventually, I listened to it more and more, and it's like. Well, it's not much different. It's kind of the same thing, just being said a little bit differently. Uh, yeah. You know, I, uh, and, and, you know, the, the traditional New Orleans, early New Orleans rock and roll and, and funk and stuff like that it, it had a, sh a huge influence on the groove that Exhorter has. So, you know, you hear a, a ton of kids today say the Beatles are overrated. I hate the Beatles. It's like, well, I don't hate the Beatles. I love the Beatles, and I don't think they're overrated at all because I can tell you musically, the the songwriting is otherworldly, and you don't have to like it, but without the Beatles, there would never have been Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath yeah. would have never existed without the Beatles. So, you know, maybe you don't like it, but but the value is there. Yeah, I, I think people have to understand the roots of evil, as we say, you know, like, look at the roots of the things and then you will be able to understand how they, uh, we have that kind of feeling to put energy and to create. And I think nowadays it's difficult to create something new because of that. People are not able to look back and recognize the importance of the 60s, 70s, you know, it's like... Uh, I am a, a huge fan of Celtic Frost, for instance, and Celtic Frost was one of the most responsible bands for, like, uh, such a variety inside of heavy metal, death metal, thrash metal, you know, like, they, they put a mix of everything together when they created Two Megatarian, for instance, and that album was, like, a, kind of a, a masterpiece for the genre when people started to listen to that and identify lots of things, and people don't understand that album when I say, like, oh, there is a lot of post-punk in there, there's a lot of hardcore, there is thrash metal in there, and people say, no, it's only death metal. No, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> there's lots of things there. Yeah. I, I, I try, I try, especially when I'm writing new music, I try not to listen to anything that's similar to what I play, because I don't want anyone else's music to influence what I'm writing. So I, I especially, I either don't listen to anything at all when I'm writing or I listen to things that are very, very different. Yeah, I, I think it was it is really important. Uh, it's like uh, I had a chat once with Alex Webster from Cannibal Corpse and uh, I was asking him like what you usually rehearse when you're not talking, like not playing Cannibal Corpse. And he looked at me, country, Johnny Cash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's yeah, like, lots of country hawk. <laughs> it's like that. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's good though. I mean, it, it's good. It's good for the diversity of their music. It'll make it sound different than everybody else. And uh, still talking about troubles, like uh, any new tours, uh, schedules, something like that. Planning the tour, um, something. We we've we we were supposed to uh, go and play some shows earlier this year, and unfortunately, we were not able to to go do them in Europe, but uh, we're trying to put something back together over there. Um, additionally, 
we're just uh, get kind of getting things prepared so we can start recording another album. So uh, there, there's there's things in motion. It's just a little slow. Yeah. And uh, for its order, any plans to come to Brazil and things like that? It would be really good. <laughs> we will be. Uh, funny that you mentioned it. There has been talk of Exorder finally uh, flying south and uh, and coming to do some shows in Central and South America. We've never done it, and it's something I've always wanted to do. I know that we have a lot of support down there, so yeah. uh, we want to come see our we want to come see our family down there. We haven't been there yet, so it's some problem. I think it'd be great. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it would be crazy with the audience here, you know, like because the Brazilian audience has a fame of being really crazy. Mainly when we have like a band such as Exorder or bands that we grew up listening to and we didn't have the opportunity to see like uh, once or twice, you know, like seeing an Exorder playing in again for the first time is going to be like, wow, you know, we're going to be there. And, and this is great, you know, yeah. the energy and the synergy between the audience and the band, you know, which is pretty good. Yeah, that's that's something that's very important to us, always has been that, that the the connection with the audience is the most important part of the show. So, uh, you know, the rest of it is just kind of extra, you know, like I, I, I want people to walk away from our show feeling like like things are never going to be the same. That would make me happy. Yeah. And uh, well, it's like uh, talking about uh, the new tendencies of re-recording things. Would you re-record the slaughter in the Vatican? No, please. <laughs> no. No. I. You know, I, a lot of people have asked us to do that. There have been people in the past in the band that wanted to. I. I don't see the point. Uh, I would rather focus on just making more new stuff um, and, and just leave leave that era behind us. Now, it's not to say that we would never do like a proper live album and have a lot of those songs that we played back then represented in live format. I think that would be interesting. But yeah, to just re to just recreate an album, I, to me, it's to me, it's a waste of time. Yeah, Exodus failed miserably, you know. Like when they he created Bounded by Blood was like, why? <laughs> why? You know, I, I don't even know that I ever listened to it, but I heard some people that loved it, and I heard some people that felt the same way that you feel about it. So to me, you know, it's it's kind of sacred territory. You know, a lot of people uh, uh, when it, when an album an album is like time capsule. Uh, it takes you back to a point in your life when you were into this. And sometimes that music helps people get through tough times in their life. So, you know, do you really want to go in there? You know, that's almost like opening up the pyramids in Egypt, you know, do you really want to do that? Yeah. It's like, and also there is like lots of things that were played in the wrong way that time that they were good. It's like the fact that they were playing in the wrong way, made it good. And if you fix it, you know, this is not, that's so good. You know, it's like, because you're learning, because you're like uh, having the feeling that it works. And then it's like, oh no, I played it wrong all my, my whole time. I'm going to fix it. And then fix it. And then get like, I need it to be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's better to just let it be, to let it rest. Yeah, it's like uh, trying to sound like a heavy man of thing, you know, it's like, no. It's like, well, it's like, uh, I think it's like time to go. And I would like you to leave a message for the Brazilian uh, audience here. We really expect to have uh, Exorder playing over here. Also, Trouble because Turbo was scheduled to play in Brazil, but we had lots of problems with COVID and things like that. Oh, wow. And then the past Eric, which was like uh, one of the saddest things ever. We had the opportunity to talk to Eric. He was like a, a very nice guy, you know, it was like very gentle. Yes, too. it was yes. great loss, you know. And I, uh, we really I, expected I have... to see. 
Yeah, I, 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 Eric was always very kind to me, um, you know, which a lot of people, you know, they, a lot of people get angry. You know, before Eric passed, people were angry that, you know, well, this guy's in the band, you know, but they, what they don't understand, first off, is that I was invited to join the band. Yeah. And secondly, Eric was very, Eric was kind, not only kind to me, he was supportive. He was like, you know, he knew how much I cared and what a fan I was of his. So he was never unkind to me or like, you know, treating me like I'm the enemy because I had his old job. He was supportive of me. He told me to, it's like, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what people say. Just go have a great time, you know, uh, and just, just, you know, give respect to the songs and, and I know you will. And and that's, to me, that was like the greatest thing he could have told me. Uh, I, I care deeply for this. I, I actually love playing the songs that he sang probably more than the ones that I sing. So uh, for everybody in Brazil, don't want to branch too much there. Um, I, I, I can't wait to get there. I've never been, and I would love to come play uh, a show. It would be an honor and a pleasure uh, to come meet all of you and, uh, you know, break bread and, and have a drink and uh, just more, more, more importantly, have a fun show, whether it's exhorter or trouble. I'm happy to come down there. Looking forward yeah. to it. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Okay, it was a great pleasure. I was like a fan of exhorter since I first listened to it in a cassette. <laughs> you know, that's very old time when we get a cassette to listen to yeah. like oh listen you know now now yeah. it's mp3 yeah. and people don't care much. <laughs> yeah a much much different world than we live in but uh i think the spirit is still the same so that's a good thing yeah i i, I think technology has the uh, the good points the bad points you know it's like uh, i am sure. a little bit against sure. mp3 because uh sometimes people download it instead of buying it and if you like a band, they think you're supposed to support the band buying the original stuff it or helps. buying it helps. Free, you know. It's like that time we didn't helps. have that time when we had cassettes, people think that we had cassettes because we were like stealing music. No, we had cassettes because we had no money. <laughs> it's like it's very difficult yeah. difficult yeah. To, to find something. So it's like the cassette was the only solution, you know. And the only way to keep a band rolling and uh, make people aware of the music, you know, nowadays technology helps a lot to uh, make people uh, aware the, of the band. The, the, like it. the best way that you can support the bands you love is to buy official merchandise. It's the fastest way to help. It really is. Yeah. And nowadays there is no excuse because it's pretty easier to get it. <laughs> yeah, it's much much more easier than in the eighties or the nineties that when we don't have the internet and things like that, you know, and it was impossible to yeah, find yeah. a vinyl. So, sure. thank you very much for the opportunity, Kyle. It was great to talk to you. As I said, it was an honor as a fan too. <laughs> and I I really hope that you were able to come to Brazil. Okay, with Treble, Exorder, both bands. <laughs> both yeah, bands would yeah. be great. I <laughs> I, I I can I concur. I'm I'm looking forward to the day. It it'll come soon enough. But thank you again for having me on the show. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Então, uh, speaking in Portuguese a little bit. Encerrando com o Caio aqui, então. Não esqueçam de né, compartilhar. Né, tem o Pix ali embaixo também quem quiser ajudar o canal, né? E fiquem ligados aí que a gente está sempre trazendo alguma curiosidade, né? Algum uh, medalhão das antigas para conversar com a gente e era isso até mais pessoal e heavy culture tá aí <risos> <risos>